The violation of God's commands are very evident in Judges chapter 18. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Embry. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. We are discovering the Bible and we're listening to it, hear what the Lord says. We're going to come to you from Judges chapter 18 in about three minutes time. It's a very, very interesting day, so stay with us. Corey and Ryan are here too. Corey? I'm also talking about Judges 19 and the square of the city, where that would have been and how we should visualize it. Ryan? Well, today I'm going back a little bit because I'm going to be talking about one of the saddest stories in Judges, the story of Samson. Yeah, I was taught Samson was a hero, yet I didn't read the Bible. When I read the Bible, I realized that's a problem. <laughs> okay. What we're going to do today? Well, if you get excited over our Friday wrap-up question, it's today. So anywhere from Joshua chapter 20 through to Judges chapter 21, I hope you're ready. Judges 18, 1 through 19. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And in those days the tribe of the Danites was seeking an inheritance for itself to dwell in. For until that day their inheritance among the tribes of Israel had not fallen to them. So the children of Dan sent five men of their family from their territory, men of valor from Zorah and Eshtaol, to spy out the land and search it. They said to them, Go search the land. So they went to the mountains of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. While they were at the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. They turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What do you have here? He said to them, Thus and so Micah did for me. He has hired me, and I have become his priest. So they said to him, Please inquire of God, that we may know whether the journey on which we go will be prosperous. And the priest said to them, Go in peace. The presence of the Lord be with you on your way. So the five men departed and went to Laish. They saw the people who were there, how they dwelt safely in the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and secure. There were no rulers in the land who might put them to shame for anything. They were far from the Sidonians, and they had no ties with anyone. Then the spies came back to their brethren at Zorah and Eshtaol, and their brethren said to them, What is your report? So they said, Arise, let us go up against them, for we have seen the land, and indeed it is very good. Would you do nothing? Do not hesitate to go and enter to possess the land. When you go... You will come to a secure people and a large land. For God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is on the earth. And six hundred men of the family of the Danites went from there, from Zorah and Eshtaol, armed with weapons of war. Then they went up and encamped in kirjath Jerem in Judah. Therefore they called that place Maenadan to this day. There it is, west of Kirjith Jerem. And they passed from there to the mountains of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. Then the five men who had gone to spy out the country of Laish answered and said to their brethren, Do you know that there are in these houses an ephod, household idols, a carved image, and a molded image? Now therefore consider what you should do. So they turned aside there, and came to the house of the young Levite man, to the house of Micah, and he greeted him. The six hundred men, armed with their weapons of war, who were of the children of Dan, stood by the entrance of the gate. Then the five men who had gone to spy out the land went up. Entering there, they took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the molded image. The priest stood at the entrance of the gate with the six hundred men who were armed with weapons of war. When these went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the molded image, the priest said to them, What are you doing? And they said to him, Be quiet. 
put your hand over your mouth and come with us. Be a father and a priest to us. Is it better for you to be a priest to the household of one man, or that you be a priest to a tribe and a family in Israel? Judges chapter 18, verses 1 through 19. You know, the tribe of Dan is fascinating. It's one of the tribes of Israel. And the judges are a time that are not really good. It's a time that's dark in Israel's history. Today we read Judges 18 to 21. We're going to focus on Judges 18. And in Judges chapter 18, it continues to reveal just how deep Israel has fallen into sin and evil. They knew who God was. They knew some of his laws but they applied them however they wanted to. Even the tribe of the Levites, who had been charged with maintaining proper worship of God and had become wayward as serving as priests of idols, and yet still blessing in the name of God. Well, men from Dan, or the tribe of Dan, inquired of the Lord through one of the idolatrous Levites who was serving as a personal priest for a man of Ephraim. The priest's role in encouraging the Danites may have helped entice this mini-military to their next disturbing action. With the priest's blessing, they steal all the cultic utensils and idols from their fellow Israelite and take the priest as their own. They wanted spiritual blessing. And the priest wanted to upgrade his priesthood over a tribe. These were not men who knew or followed the ways of God. Now, beloved, we need to hear this because today there are so many people that would suggest to us and would offer us so many things of God. But is that really God? God has his calling to us, but he has his way of doing things which we oftentimes do not hear. Take your Bible guide. If you don't have one, you can call us or you can write to us or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, also BibleDiscoveryGuide.com and you can click on the Bible guide and it will take you to a donate page. Let me say thank you for your donations. That's very, very important. Donations keep us uh, current with God's uh, plans of Uh, distributing his word and all of that. And then you can download it exactly how we've printed it. Now, Father, I pray today, as we read this scripture, that you would help us to understand exactly what you're doing and what you're saying. And help us to read from the Bible and not apply our ideas in the Bible or take it and support what we believe. Help us to hear you, Lord. It's a very big shift in our reading and change our perception of your word through your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says in Judges chapter 18, in those days, there was no king in Israel. And those days, the tribe of the Danites was seeking an inheritance for itself to dwell in. For until that day, their inheritance among the tribes of Israel had not fallen to them. So, The children of Dan sent five men of their family from their territory, men of valor from Zorah and Eshtol, to spy out the land and search it. And they said to them, go search the land. So they went to the mountains of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and they lodged there. And while they were at the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of a young Levite. They turned aside and said to him, who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? Where do you have here? Or what do you have here? And he said to them, thus, and so Micah did for me. He has hired me and I have become his priest. So they said to him, please inquire of God so that we may know whether the journey on which we go will be prosperous. And the priest said to them, go in peace. The presence of the Lord be with you on your way. The first point is this. The violations of God's command are obvious to us in Judges 18. God's people are called to know his word. The Levites were assigned to the tribes. The Levites were assigned to God. 
the Levites were to represent God to the people and the people to God. Very, very important. There was one place where they did that, and that was Jerusalem. Well, Shiloh. Not Jerusalem yet. Jerusalem will come. But nevertheless, that was all abandoned. And this priest had come there, and Micah had made him the priest, and it was a massive distortion. So you've got a distorted mess being interfered with with another distorted mess. Well, that brings us to the next point we read, which is verse 7. So the five men departed and went to Laish. They saw the people who were there, how they dwelt safely in the manner of the Sidonians, quite quiet and secure. There were no rulers in the land who might put them to shame for anything. They were far from the Sidonians, and they had no ties with anyone. Well, then the spies came back to their brethren at Zorah and Eshtol, and their brethren said to them, what is your report? So they said, arise, let us go up against them, for we have seen the land that indeed it is very good. Would you do nothing? Do not hesitate to go and enter to possess the land. And when you go, you will come to a secure people and a large land. For God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is on the earth. Now, this is interesting. Listen carefully. The Danites knew that their mission in the land was ordained by God, but that it is all they knew. We must do God's will and task his ways. We've been, look, we've been talking about this for the past couple of days. God is a call for each of us, beloved. We need to do God's calling, absolutely. But we need to do it his way, not our way. I mean, there are many times when I see on television or on the internet or in, uh, in radio or listen to it or however you want to hear it, however you want to see it, and you wonder, did they do that God's way or did they do that their own way? And God is making that clear to us now with various ministries. Beloved, what we need to do is we need to say, God, I need to do things your way. Help us to do that. All right, let's go on because this gets interesting in verse 11. And the 600 men of the family of the Danites went from there, from Zorah and Eshtol, armed with weapons of war. Then they went up to, up to and encamped in Kerjareth Jerem in Judah. Therefore, they called that place Mahana, Dan to this day. There it is, west of Kajareth Jerah. And they passed from there to the mountains of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. And then the five men who had gone to spy out the country of Laish answered and said to their brethren, Do you know that there are in these houses an ephod, household idols, a carved image and molded image? Now, therefore, consider what you should do so. They turned aside there, and they came to the house of the young Levite man, to the house of Micah, and they greeted him. And the 600 men, armed with their weapons of war, who were of the children of Dan, stood by the entrance of the gate. And then the five men who had gone to spy out the land went up entering there. They took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the molded image. And the priest stood at the entrance of the gate with 600 men who were armed with weapons of war. And when these men went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the molded image, the priest said to them, what are you doing? And they said to him, be quiet, put your hand over your mouth, come with us, be a father and a priest to us. It is better for you to be a priest to the household of one man, or that you may be a priest to the tribe and the family of Israel. The Danites went back to steal the shrine and the idols and the priests. Beloved, we will disobey God when we do not know his word. We will disobey God when we do not know his word. You need to read the Bible. We need to read the Bible. Because the Bible tells us that there were wrong things going on here. Because you can see it in in the ink. You can see it. And beloved, we need to see the word of God today. 
Hi there, Bible Discovery TV is available to you 24 seven. If you have Roku, you can download our app and you can watch all of our programs at your own convenience. We're also available on Amazon Fire. So just search Bible Discovery TV and you'll be able to find us. Did you know that Bible Discovery TV is available on your phone? You can watch the program whenever and wherever is most convenient for you. On iPhone or Android, search for Bible Discovery TV in the App Store. All right, so I know that we read about Samson on yesterday's program, but before we conclude the book of Judges for this year, I really wanted to spend some time on this tragic historical figure. Samson was a judge and a Nazarite, and he lived at a time in Israel's history when everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. There weren't any Jewish kings yet, but God raised up leaders to judge and deliver his people from the hand of their enemies. Samson was one of these deliverers. And while he was very reckless, God was still able to use him. Prior to the rule of any Israelite king, when everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes, was born Samson. Even before the womb, God had ordained him to be a judge among his people and to begin delivering the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines. He was to be a Nazarite, one set apart to God from birth. But his reckless behavior and weakness for women made him seem a very poor choice. At first, everything seemed to be going according to plan. Samson grew and the spirit of the Lord began to move upon him. But Samson decided to marry a Philistine woman, which aggravated his parents. Yet there was no talking him out of it. This choice set him on a deadly collision course with the Philistines. Deadly for them, deadly for him. Indeed, though Samson's parents were unaware, God was using this opportunity to ultimately bring the Philistines to ruin. It first began to manifest during the seven-day wedding feast. For when Samson discovers that he has been conspired against by his bride and some Philistines over a wager he made, he leaves in a rage. When he returns and finds that his wife has been given over to another man, he burns the Philistines' grain fields, vineyards, and olive groves. When the Philistines return fire and burn his wife and her father, Samson makes a great slaughter of them all. Though Samson returned home, he would soon be arrested by his own people and delivered back to the Philistines. However, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and with nothing more than a donkey's jawbone, he slew a thousand men. Although the Philistines would make another attempt upon Samson during his one-night stay with a harlot in Gaza, he once again escaped. For twenty years, Samson had overpowered and eluded the Philistines, but all of that was about to change. For when they learn of Samson's love for Delilah, they offer her a significant sum of silver if she can discover the secret of Samson's power. After a great deal of enticement, Samson finally breaks down. No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me. Now exposed, Delilah lulls Samson to sleep and has his head shaved. In moments, the angry Philistine mob is upon him, but he is powerless. So he is blinded, shackled, and imprisoned. Yet Samson's divine mission was not yet complete. Indeed, sometime later, when his hair had partially returned, he is brought to the Philistine temple for the entertainment of thousands. But Samson sets himself between two supporting pillars, and in one last prayer he pleads with God, let me die with the Philistines. So he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. You know, every time I read Samson's story, I'm reminded of how tragic it is. It didn't have to end the way that it did. Had he been more God-centered in his thinking, things could have been a lot different. But unfortunately, his desire for pleasure and for women overruled his love for God, and it cost him. As a matter of fact, Samson's interaction with women forms the very backbone of the biblical account of his life. And this feature might be foreshadowed in his birth narrative, in which the angel of the Lord appeared to Samson's mother before his father. Whatever the case, it would be a woman, Delilah, who would bring this mighty man down. Very, yeah. very sad. Very, very sad. And and we see that all happening here. So that's very, very good. Thank you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Corey? 
All right, Judges 19, it's a terrible story, but I wanna focus in on an element of it that is interesting nonetheless. So we're told that uh, the when, when the couple goes to uh, the city, they sit in the city square and essentially are waiting for someone to show them hospitality, for someone to invite them to, you know, stay with them. Uh, and this doesn't happen until really the end of the day, but I wanna focus in on that territory, the city square, where, where would that have been in an ancient city and what would that have looked like? It turns out it would have been associated with the city's gate. Take a look. City gates in the biblical world had many functions. And if you look closely, all of the functions known from history are demonstrated in the Bible. First, we need to understand the layout of city gates. They weren't just oversized doorways. A lot of planning went into their construction, as their most obvious function was defense. They were a natural weak point in the city wall that had to be fortified. Double gates were often employed to solve this problem. There would be an outer gate, a courtyard, and then an inner gate. This double gate system created a public space, its courtyard, that was home to all sorts of interactions. The Bible tells us that the elders of a city sat in the gate, presumably the courtyard. Here, the elders were responsible for facilitating and witnessing business transactions, like Boaz becoming Ruth's kinsman redeemer in Ruth chapter 4. And the elders were responsible for delivering legal judgment. In Deuteronomy, we learn how people accused of crimes would be brought before the elders at the gates, and that if the death penalty was given, it was done right there. This is no doubt one of the reasons that Deuteronomy also admonishes the Israelites to write the laws of God on their gates, keeping those elders on target. Public messages could also be delivered at the gate, and 2 Kings 7 tells us that flour and barley were either sold here or their prices were determined here. Interestingly, archaeology has revealed large public buildings close to city gate complexes. These are sometimes interpreted as stables, but may actually be public storerooms where goods could be purchased. Once Israel appointed a king over themselves, he too had a special spot at the city gate. King David has an interesting history with city gates. What may have been his most humiliating moment happened at one. He faked a severe mental breakdown to escape a powerful enemy. He survived, though, which leads to another unfortunate event later in his life. His son Absalom had launched rebellion against him, initiated by stopping people on their way to Jerusalem's gate to receive David's judgment. David reluctantly launched a counterattack after full war was declared. The Bible is really specific in detail here. David stands by the gate while his entire military walks out to battle, then sits in his seat in the gate, waiting. When he receives the news of Absalom's death, he's overcome and leaves the gate to cry, which is a bad sign for the people. Apparently, the king's authority in the gate after war was essential, so David comes back and resumes his place of authority. Excavations at the northern city of Tel Dan revealed a gate complex dating to the 9th century BC. There was a built-in bench, perhaps where elders would sit. But most intriguingly of all, there was a raised platform with decorative stone sockets, likely used to hold the poles of a canopy, a seat fit for a king. So there we go. One of the functions of the city gate was as a gathering place. And it makes sense for them to be sitting there, right? That, that the city square to be there so that anyone who is coming and going in the city is going to see them and then have the societal obligation to invite them in, which of course doesn't happen, which is uh, until the very end of the day, which is a foreshadowing that all is not well. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Now, city gates are fascinating because Villages, it's different than it is today. Villages didn't have walls mm -hmm. and didn't have gates, but cities did. And it says in the Bible, and we're going to read this in the future, when Solomon took over, that he took many of these villages and built walls around right, them, making them cities. Them. Yeah. And so that it's really interesting to see those those transitions in the Bible. So thank you, Corey. Very good. All right, Janice, let's go. Well, Corey has a few seconds here to talk Tell about us, the Corey. weekends. 
Ah, the weekend show. Yes, I was like, wait a second, what? What am I doing? Yes, the weekend show.、Uh, we release them Fridays on YouTube. It's my husband and I.、Uh, we talk about everything that we were assigned to read that week and issues that pop up that we don't have time to talk about here on the Daily Show. And we also、uh, talk about your questions and comments as well that we gather from our YouTube comment section. So if you're curious, hop on over there. It's my name, Corey Babetchko. You can just search that on YouTube and find me. So my questions are usually a lot easier than the ones posed to you and Matlock. <laughs> they're they're However, a lot faster. Yes, but you do give multiple choices as well, I, which I is do, quite nice. Which which helps. I like a、it. lot. Sometimes, sometimes <laughs> I don't. It's okay. We're going to ask the question. It's a short question, actually a short answer too. So here it is. Anywhere from Joshua chapter twenty through to Judges chapter twenty one. I'm going to pose the question to Ryan and Corey. How old was Joshua when he died? How old was Joshua when he died? Was he one hundred years old? Was he one hundred and ten years old? Or was he one hundred and twenty years old? How old was Joshua when he died? I'm not saying a word.、Mm. Very good. good I'm just、you. over here being.、Quiet. We're confident. I, <laughs> yes, I, we、uh, are. We're confident. We are. Yes,、yep. we're very confident. All right. Well, I asked. I asked this question. Several days ago, but you <laughs> answered it. But go ahead. It's one hundred and ten. One hundred and ten. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, let's take a look into the Bible. Judges chapter two, verse eight. Always check out the answers. Always check them out. Okay. Judges two, verse eight. Now Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was one hundred and ten years old. So if you guessed with Ryan and Corey, one hundred and ten, you are one hundred percent. Right, good for you. And if you didn't get the answer right, that's okay.、Monday、a week from today, we're going to be back again with a new question, and we can start all over again. Talking about First Samuel five Monday. I do want to thank you for supporting this ministry.、Uh, we can't go further without your support, so we really appreciate it. And I want to pray for you because I know there's a lot of people who are struggling, and、uh, this is a very difficult time. I, I understand that, believe me. And so let's pray together, Father. I ask in Jesus' name that you would help us to know the difference between wants and needs. We understand that you have told us that you will fulfill our needs. So thank you, Lord, for fulfilling our needs and help us today. Amen.